Yesterday we had a very extra, this is a really extraordinary and unusual performance, uh, I suppose, and uh, it's uh, and uh, because it was so unusual, I think it is much to talk about to for, about the, the concept of the work, which is uh, was uh, very very different from other thing, uh, other concept that we could uh, hear at the Warsaw Autumn Fair Festival. So, with great pleasure, I would like to introduce the composer, Simon Loeffler, and the performers, Anna Marte Serlian Holland, Jennifer Torrance, and Inga Margarete Ass. I suppose uh, what we uh, experienced yesterday um, required much uh, cooperation between the composer and uh, performers and the roles that the performers uh, had to play in this piece uh, are, um, I suppose, different from, uh, from other tasks that they are uh, set to. Um, so first, um, uh, first question. Um, please, um, uh, uh, I read in the show, in the notes for the program that you are interested in the musicality of animals. So it's a very interesting question because I think uh, the Warsaw Autumn public is uh, accustomed to very to uh, to, uh, to to unusual. Uh, Pro, pro, uh, pro, uh, propositions uh, and uh, unusual art forms, but I suppose that people who came just accidentally to the concert might think, is it music or it is uh, quite other art form? So uh, this question of uh, musicality of uh, animals, which was important for you to, in creating this piece, uh, would you like to tell something about it, how you understand it? And of course, it is a part of a general question of how the work was prepared, how, what was the concept, and uh, very broad question. Yes, uh, I, can, uh, I can start with the broad contours of this uh, project. Um, the, the general idea, I think, was to... Uh, think about music in a way such that we don't need to define what music is, but we can become musical in different ways. Just like other species seem to become artistically expressive in different ways with their bodies. Uh, so we were not interested, I was not interested in um, defining what a, what a musical performance is as such, but I was interested in exploring a, a territory that seemed musical in certain very basic parameters. Um, rhythmic uh, impulses, uh, insinuations of melodic contours, uh, movement, um, a certain way of moving, certain ways of having uh, body parts, so all of these come into one single nucleus as a becoming musical. Uh, and uh, my, uh, my guides were other species. Uh, I was very interested in the likes of insects, spiders, uh, certain birds, um, pigeons uh, particularly, very much uh, animals that live in our immediate surroundings in Oslo and Copenhagen, where I began uh, thinking about these things. And then um, I arrived in Oslo for this, this uh, PhD project, and I quickly got affiliated with these uh, collaborators. And uh, the, the, the music started to evolve in very long collaboration processes such that um, it became a matter of working very specifically with the eyelids of Anna Marta and the, uh, the let's say, the, the bird visions with Jennifer and then later Inga. And uh, the, um, 
the swan piece was kind of my own self exploration into a kind of a swan proximity musicality. Um, so that's that's the general gist of how the project uh, came about and how it uh, evolved, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. I suppose you studied the behavior of animals before composing this uh, piece. Is it right? Uh, yeah, um, but not studied in a scientific manner. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, animal scientists, they spend a lot of time trying to define stuff. And also that, you know, you can read many books about is it music, is it not music? Uh, do they have memory or not? Do they have consciousness or not? And this is not interesting for me. I have a very uh, a loose, interpretative um, approach, and I'm interested in proximity. I mean, I am interested in getting closer to. I'm not interested in defining, uh, you know, does the spider play harp music on its web or not? It's, it's, that's not um, that's not the purpose of uh, my approach. Mm -hmm. Well, and how did the cooperation look like with uh, with the performers? I think that performers could also say a word about how they felt. Well. Yeah, we can perhaps begin with Anna Martin. Yeah. Um, well, the work that we have done with the, the eyelash piece was a very long process. It's a we started talking about it, I think, almost like the first time we met, <laughs> because you showed me some pictures of some long eyelashes, and I, I thought it was very interesting and beautiful. And then um, Simon actually made several versions of the piece with the eyelashes, and the first one, we, I performed it in 2020. So we were working a lot also during COVID lockdown <coughs> with this uh, music and uh, in the beginning it was much more like composed in a more like how to say traditional manner with rhythms and pauses and like memorizing a score and we he did also one more version like this which was yeah um, quite uh, challenging like physically with movements with the eyes and yeah, it was pretty hard to play actually, and, but nice. But then we came to this uh, understanding that the material was more interesting when it came, when it was more like alive in itself somehow, like like the eyelashes was also living creatures. And we started to more study what was possible and what was natural for my eyelashes, more than like Simon trying something and writing it and then I was learning it. This was more like it came from my own body. So then the piece changed quite a lot. Um, and then we also had this idea to include the puppets. It was Simon's idea to uh, make a trio <laughs> so that, uh, yeah, I don't know so that I won't get like dementia when I'm old or something, because it's very, <laughs> you know, for the brain to play three parts at the same time. So, um, um, yeah, I don't know what to say about that part of the process. It was fun. I work a lot with the puppet theater as a musician also, so I know a lot of these French puppeteers, and uh, that's I guess that's also where this the fox puppet idea started, maybe? You want to say something more about this? No, uh, maybe talk about the birds. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, I'm Jennifer. Um, I will talk about the bird duo, and I think a little bit about the butterfly duo, uh, because they have similar trajectories, but in different, for different reasons. In 2019, Simon asked me if I wanted to play a duet for two birds that have beaks and bells um, hanging from their ears, kind of earrings, 
and then bells on top of the beaks. And then we would sort of move across each other, hitting each other's bells on each other's faces. And this is a very, this is the first version of the bird duo, and it's a very rhythmic, rigorous, virtuosic thing. And then we had the premiere in Berlin in January 2020, and we were really prepared for success. But in the performance, my bells started to fall off my face and then come off my ears to the point where Simon had to stop because he couldn't reach with his little beak to hit my bell. So in this moment, he started, ha, 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 the oh shit moment. Um, do we continue or do we stop? So it was something in between. I, I refused to stop. I stayed my, as a bird. And then Simon started to fix my instruments on my face. And then we start again. And for 10 seconds later, it falls apart again. And at this point, this virtuosic, rigorous piece became a, a slapstick comedy thing. And all of our friends in Berlin who came to support us were laughing at us at first and then with us, because then we were a part of the, the joke. And this was a really beautiful experience where in, in the act of this piece completely falling apart and us seeing the piece in a totally new way, it opened up. And what I would say that opening up was, for me, Simon was composing for instruments on our faces when we started. And then after this moment, this crisis moment, I believe he started to compose interaction and to create situations for interaction. And the, the core of the interaction is affection in the end. But there was a, a second version where Simon tried to make it more game-like. So we, we have these virtuosic moments, but then there are, are cues that could happen between us. And actually, we never got to realize this version because of COVID. And, but it's, it was a step on the, in the way. And then the next version was to make a piece for Inga and I, and, and we are partners. So it's very easy to go into this intimacy element. And then the work really became not about virtuosity at all, but about a very deep listening, because um, our eyes are shut all of the time, and we're just trying to find each other's beak with our eyes closed. What I find interesting about this in, in relation to the, the Berlin version was that we were blinded in the Berlin version in the sense that we didn't know how to go forward, and we were totally disoriented. But now he has composed this disorientation into the work that we have our eyes closed, and there are phrases, and we turn to each other, hoping to meet. Okay, we met. Okay, let's do the little phrase, and then we turn away again. Okay, let's try again, find each other again. But in this little gesture of turning, we make mistakes all the time. So this is a really interesting trajectory, and the th I think the same thing happened in the butterfly piece. At first, it was completely composing music for instruments and instrumentalists, and then it kind of dissolved or loosened into a very affection interaction. I'm still processing all the things Jennifer said. Um, my name is Inga, and I think I'm the one that came into this collaboration, like um, the last person that kind of joined Simon's animal world. Um, and I've been thinking, um, yeah, because Simon talks about it as a collaboration. And at first I was a bit surprised because Simon made, I think, um, all the kind of artistic decisions, it feels like. But then I was thinking more about it. And I think that it's really based on a lot of trust between... Simon and the performers, and also between the performers, like Jennifer just talked about, that to play these pieces, it, it requires a lot of trust. Um, and so I think that, in a way, it's been a collaboration because um, at every step, we have been like trusting you, you have been trusting us, and it's we have kind of found our way together. Although I feel like you have really 
been making the artistic decisions. We have all been shaping the the work, the the process together. Um, so I think that's something that um, I really appreciated with this project. And to follow up on what Jennifer said about this composing interactions, I was thinking about it yesterday in our rehearsal, um, that um, in the piece we played together with our beaks, we have our eyes closed, and so we have this sensation of searching, reaching out, connecting, not finding the connection, finding the connection. And then when I play the swan duo with Simon, we basically also don't see much because we have a, um, some, a sheet in front of our eyes. And we're, so we're also like all the time searching for each other, like where's Simon now? <laughs> where do we go? Are we moving in this direction, in this direction? So also the swan duo really has this similar sensation when playing the piece. And also that the sounds are very soft, so you have to always, like sometimes we cannot really hear each other. But in this trying to hear what's not always possible to hear, it's a very wonderful place to be when performing. Um, yeah, and I think that composing like that, um, is maybe not um, something that you can just do without having a lot of trust. Um, yeah, so I think that's the special thing about this project for me. Question for Simon: uh, How does Animalia relate to other work of yours and to your few, few future plans? It it relates in the sense that it um, it changed me into a new composer. I would say um, bef before I was more traditional in my sense of what a co what the composer idiom means. So I made the work; others played it. Or I made the work and I played it with others. Now uh, it's um, uh, it's more a question. I'm more interested in being in infiltrated, so to speak, by by others, uh, and also in collaboration, and also uh, by circumstance. Let's say. Um, so I am. I'm trying to move. I'm basically trying to continue the the sense of this work in new collaborations. Um, that's one thing. Another thing is that um, I was very mechanical beforehand. I, I made instruments that were somehow precise and um, uh, moving. You know, very sharply and. And and metrically, um, metrically clear. And um, now I'm much more into the body uh, to get closer and closer to the body. Uh, where does uh, where does the body stop and where does the instrument start? How to stay on that borderline? Um, and I'm very the the. the all these works deal very much with creating a tiny territory. Uh, when Inga talks about um, that you can really see each other while playing, so you constantly have to navigate in space. Uh, and you do that through music, so to speak. So you play music in order to stay coordinated in space. Um, this I'm very interested in, how to how to uh, make a territory of, 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 of music, so to speak, through music. Um, so, yeah. I realize that's a very loose um, description of, of uh, in response to your question, but uh, those are some of the things that go through my mind a lot. I, I'm, I'm also, uh, as a, 
I said, I'm also thinking about how to reverse it all. <laughs> like, what it what would it mean to go back to a normal instrument, if, if it's possible or not? I tried recently, um, and um, it was it was a weird process. Uh, it was free rehearsals only, and uh, we had three years together. But free rehearsals in the normalized real world is a it's a new reality. So, so that's that's more or less the gist of, the, of it. Yeah. <laughs> and what are the next uh, project of, of yours? The next, okay. Um, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I have uh, some conversations with different people, some soloists, some groups, um, and in most cases, it's about performing with them. But uh, I don't really have a. I actually don't have a concrete plan for the next few months. I will. Uh, I will take a break from working, and I will go into the I idea zone. <laughs> I just wanted to follow up that one thing, one big change that's happened that we've gotten to observe in Simon. There's a lot of changes. Uh, really great ones. And one is that you're performing more and you want to perform more. And I think this shift is a really interesting one. And maybe you can talk about this, if you're, what your plans are for future performing for your, yourself. And maybe why this happened. Why it happened uh, the past three years or why yeah, it happened? Yeah, this, this urge, this change from the composer to wanting to perform. I don't know. Um, I, I, f I just find it more uh, liberating to be in it rather than outside of it. Um, and uh, it's much more easy to... Uh, it's much more easy to change the music when you're inside the music for me. When I look at it from the outside, it's like an architect looking at a building and I start to change everything about it. But when I'm inside the music, I play it myself, I realize it's about the nuances of playing rather than changing structurally what I'm doing. So it's a, it's an it's an enriching perspective to be inside, in my opinion. And um, I I I would like to uh, work towards um, not changing the musicianship of musicians necessarily as much as I've done in this project, because you had to adapt to a completely new setup for a long time. I would like to uh, place myself alongside a musicianship, you know? Like for instance, if I had to do a work for cello in the future, I would say, okay, you are a cellist. I ex very much respect that. I will place myself alongside that and I will complement that as me as a musician, right? Because to work like we did, we need years, in my opinion. So I think that's a pragmatic, but also maybe a, an interesting way to work or something. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. If Andy Maria published a score, could you imagine that someone takes the material and uh, and performs a piece for someone else? Uh, not at the moment. No, it's too much embodied in. It's partly scored. It, it, I began scoring and I slowly moved away from it. Uh, probably because uh, we all started to just know the material so much that the score got in the way. And it's, it's, it's actually true that you can, if, if everything is clearly notated, you get stuck a little bit with it. But when you're trying to adapt constantly, uh, it's much easier to work from memory and you just say, uh, can we do this instead of this? And, 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 and it's cumbersome to, to work through the notation. Um, so I think if other people had to play this stuff, they would have to learn it from the performers themselves. It would have to be from a personal relation. And at the moment, I don't really see that. Uh, that's it's not in the cards right now. 
but I I like that idea that you pass on a piece orally um, from performer to performer, let's say. I, I, I think that would be a very nice thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know how you see that, actually. If you could teach the bird piece to somebody else. We could try. <laughs> see, see what happens. But then I guess, again, there's a need for letting it be their version. Mm. Other opinions? The eyelash, can you teach it to someone? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. It, I, f I feel that it's very much our piece, my piece, our piece. I would, but I always, it's always like this for me with certain things that I've been working a lot, um, uh, being part of the process that I think it's always hard to imagine someone else doing it. Um, but sometimes it's it's necessary and, and or, yeah, and then it works normally also. So I think it's like Inga said then it would have to be like a their version of the eyelashes or the foxes or I don't know. Yeah. Yes. A and conversely, I think there's an interesting idea in letting things die. So when they are gone, the music is gone. I also like that idea actually, because I think there's an uh, there's an obs there's an obsession today with. Um, uh, documenting things and making things uh, live for as long as possible eternally. Uh, it's a conception of history in the Western world that I think is weird. So uh, I think I think it would be a nice idea. Also, I mean, we'll see what happens if 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 this music simply dies slowly uh, with us. <laughs> but I don't know. This, <laughs> this is uh, undecided. I guess we'll see what happens. I have some questions from the public now. Uh, we all know that Copenhagen is considered to be of so-called a smart city. There is even a term that to Copenhagenize ambient, I mean to make it much sustainable. I wonder, do you think that your music could promote this modern lifestyle based on friendly attitude towards other than humans inhabitants of our cities? Um, well, first of all, Denmark is a country that has less than 2% protected uh, nature. So the country basically managed to wipe out any kind of gen gen genuine wildlife. And so the um, the uh, the attempt to make Copenhagen a sustainable city is a bit like um, killing everything and then trying to make things grow again. <laughs> uh, I don't uh, know if that will happen at all. What I can say is that um, animals at present don't really fit into a modern city like Copenhagen, and I think it should. And I think one of the one of the big challenges. To, a comp to, to include other species is to not do. Human beings always think that they have to, to be act proactive in order to uh, create cohabitation. But it's the other way around, in my opinion. They should allow to be infiltrated. They should not do, not build, not make trees grow fast. The trees will grow if they just are given time and space, you know. So it, it's kind of a ultra modern way of thinking sustainability in Denmark, in my opinion, that uh, does not really harmonize with my view on what what the natural is, natural in brackets. Does that answer your question or not?
the last question from me, if there aren't any from the, from the public. Could you say perhaps something about uh, constructing in instruments, so the thing that you were involved very much in, in past years? Yes, um, this is what I spend 90% of my time on uh, in this project and other projects, making the instrument. Um, and this is, uh, I would say, half of the composition process to envision how and what you are playing with. And um, I choose to construct everything myself. I'm not an expert in it, but it 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 provides a process where there's a long time where you're trying, for instance, to make eyelids and it's not really working, but um, the sense of why it's not working also gives you a sense of what you're trying to do, what you want to go towards. And um, in past years I had sometimes other people build certain things for me and uh, it was unsatisfactory in many ways because um, you, you, uh, the way things are built uh, leave and leave a clear mark in the music it's it's unavoidable you know so i'm interested in the relation between what i'm making and the music that will arise and who is playing and so i'm i'm always building things myself to place uh, myself in it so to speak um, furthermore in this project since it was very much about the uh animal body, uh, I really tried to get away from um, modern technology, which was very difficult. So I made everything from straw, wood, uh, natural plastic, not, not um, PVC or anything like this, and uh, glue, <laughs> um, and sewing a lot, uh, which was very nice. Uh, but also it inevitably gives all the instruments, or let's call them body parts, a fragility. They break a lot. Um, they grow old. And you have to repair constantly. And uh, that's, yeah, I don't know. It, it's, it becomes very philosophical when you go into why, what that gives you. Because normally you would think that you make something and it just works. And that's the way we deal with entities in this world. We buy a car and it has to work. Instruments that kind of work, but also maybe it doesn't exactly work, it forces your body to adapt. And it, 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 it changes the music essentially. And it's, it's, it's a positive force if you can continue to work like that for a long time and you adapt to it. And, but it's a negative thing if you don't have time to adapt, if you don't have time to put on the suit and it becomes you in a sense. So it's a choice. It's a choice, yeah. Um, yeah. It's very interesting that instruments are so affiliated with um, ways of thinking about technology, thinking about the body thinking about um, the passing of time, how they, how they uh, break down slowly, instruments. Um, they are kind of, this kind of object or this kind of, uh, you, you can think about many things through what you're building in a way, if, if you want. And I want. So. <laughs> Thanks for your questions. Okay, if uh, there are no questions, so um, I would just like to thank you for, for the yesterday performance, which was really uh, an experience which, uh, which, uh, which we will remember. As, uh, I'm of sp speaking not only in my name, but what I heard in the con conversation of... Uh, thank you other uh, people at the concert and we are looking forward to seeing you again here in Warsaw. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. <laughs>